That was Lacrimae by John Dowland, uh, Poulton number 15. And follow the lesson for free. Uh, we'll be talking about some context
for the piece, but if you're interested, I do have an edition of the work and there's a link for that in the description. So when we're dealing with a, a more advanced work like this, I think the first thing I'll say is that if you've played a lot of smaller Dowland pieces, uh, playing this piece will not be too difficult. You have lots of context for what you're doing. And in a lot of Dowland's music, you know, the chord shapes are somewhat similar, depending on the piece. So, and like the way he does his divisions, like those little variations where he plays the same melody but with running lines then, you know, you'll have experienced that before and you'll kind of understand that he's doing like small variations on themes. So my recommendation to you is that if, if you know, this piece is, is more on the advanced side, so if, if you haven't played a lot of Dowland, go to my site. There's lots of easier Dowland works that you can, you can play that are really beautiful. So work your way up to this piece by playing those. And there, it's even in my, my graded repertoire series as well. So just make sure you're working your way up because otherwise I think you'll find this piece relatively um, awkward and a little bit difficult. This piece is, uh, if, if you don't know the Lacrimé and later on the Seven Tears, um, there's, a, there's a song, this was written first, but there's a song called Flow My Tears. Um, you might want to listen to the vocal um, version. You can follow the link in the description and I'll, I'll post a video of, of the vocal version so that, so that you have lots of vocal context because that beautiful singing line uh, is very, is brought up very nicely by the voice, of course. So knowing all the different versions of it will be really important. And in the seven tiers, you can hear lots of, of versions of this, so. Now, this particular work is, is basically divided into three sections. So he'll, he presents a theme, and then at the double bar line, he does a division on that, on that theme. So he, he, he plays the same music, but, but a, embellishes it a little bit. So, for example, if we, when you compare, for example, measure one to measure nine. Measure nine is a variation on that. You know, so he's, he embellishes that theme. So that happens at every double bar line. So up to, up to uh, measure nine we have the, th the first theme and then the variation and then measure 17 all the way up to measure 24 we have a new theme and then a variation on that uh, and then measure 33 we have a new theme and then a, a variation on that and then and then that's the end of the piece so just be aware that you you like I just did an example there of playing the theme and then the variation back to back, you might want to just do that. Take the first measure of a theme and then the first measure of the variation and make sure that you understand that you are doing um, embellishments on the theme. It's like a theme in variations, but it's, it's a little bit different in, in this time period. Now, uh, the only other thing to discuss before we do a walkthrough is, is fingering. Now, there's a fine line here between choosing the perfect fingering for legato and voice sustain and then practicality. And it's a really tough one for that. And I have definitely sided on legato. So there's some awkward fingerings in here, but the reason they're awkward is because we're holding on to certain notes to make sure they sustain. It's, it's a relatively slow work, although some of the lines are fast, but so it's very sustained and you can really hear if a voice disconnects. So we'll be talking about that as we go through it. Of course, we have the third string tuned on to F sharp and the capo on that puts us into relative lute tuning. It also, with the capo, it makes some of the chord, the awkward chords a little bit easier to handle in the left hand. So I would definitely recommend doing that. And like I said, if, if you've played other Dallin works, this, none of this will be new to you. So even right from the beginning, we have some, some awkward fingerings. <laughs> So I really want to sustain that bass, but we have this upper A to deal with. It's a little bit cramped. 
plant going for one, but it's so necessary to sustain notes because it's this beautiful sustained texture. And that's why the piece ends up being more on the, the more advanced side, right? Even some stretches like that. The bar chord is necessary there so that we sustain the up these notes while playing the other ones. add slurs into some of those notes but I generally play down and without slurs just getting a real even kind of plucky sound most of the time the other thing I'll mention is that sometimes the notation can look a little bit um, wacky because there's so many voices involved and I've really done my voice separation mainly based on the Poulton notation and grand stave of course it's been reduced to one stave here so it gets a little bit messy later on there's some smaller notes in smaller notation those have no significance. I'm just trying to clean up the score because it can be difficult to listen to. Like I said, though, um, get to know the, the work and all the versions of it, and, and you can just, um, you'll be able to play through it. So now we have the, the variation starting at measure nine. So I, I use my third finger on E here because I want to sustain that E the whole time for its proper value. Same thing there as I'm holding the C. So I have to squeeze two and one in here. It's a little bit cramped. You could change the fingering. Um, you could use three. Just and let go of that other bass note. It might not be that noticeable. But like I said, I've sided on, on the legato side and the sustain side. So some of the fingerings will reflect that. Measure 11. double first finger because the C is still sustaining. Don't let those rhythmic divisions freak you out too much. If you put the metronome on the eighth note, you can see where the beaming is separated on the score. The, it's really clear in, in terms of the eighth note pulse and you, I don't want to say use rubato because it's not in the romantic sense but you, you don't have to play it super strictly but you just want the main pulses to to land you know the quarter note pulse to to land properly so that you can feel the pulse so that you can feel the pulse and uh, and then don't stress about them just uh, learn them with the metronome first and then turn the metronome off relax and just play through it nicely so at measure 17, we have a, a new section here, a new theme. You can see another kind of fingering where, where I use two because three has to be used. Observe the bass note rests a little bit here so you don't get too much um, um, bleeding of the harmony from one to the next. So just where those eighth note rests are in the bass voice, I would observe. Don't worry about the upper voice so much. tapestry in terms of the rhythmic the way the rhythms piece together because of all the different voices it can look kind of uh, confusing to look at but 
when you actually play it, it's just a series of eighths and sixteenth notes. Measure 25, we have the variation on that theme. last E open, it's closed in the manuscript, but I don't want to let go of this chord and I, I'm out of fingers. So uh, I play it open, but just make sure after you do that, mute it out with your kind of bar just kind of coming down and just touching that string to mute out the E. You don't really want, you know, that E to be ringing out at the same time as that final chord. But playing it open makes it a lot smoother and, and easier. So like I said, in measure 29 there, uh, those smaller note the smaller notes have no significance. They're just um, they're just to clean up the rhythmic score. It looks very confusing if I make them all large, rhythmically speaking. Okay, measure 33, we have a new theme. measure there, measure 37, you could sustain that E properly. I've left the sustain of the E as a proper voice, but uh, you do run out of fingers. So I, I replace it. But you, if, you, if your hands are big enough and you're comfortable with the stretch, you could do a full bar right away. And then that E will con the E on the fourth string will continue to sustain. Um, I find that just a little bit too awkward to do, uh, a little bit stressful for the hand, so I, I didn't do it, but that's an option available to you. Measure 38. <laughs> on that theme. Measure the same thing if you want. You can you can do the bar early, but actually it feels pretty comfortable now. So maybe I maybe I should have done it in the in the performance. But uh, that's that's an option. chord occurs so many times in the music so make sure you're really comfortable with that B chord. Uh, so like I said um, the, I, I, I'm not going to do like a how to play video specifically because um, you need to work your way up to this there's too much there's too many notes uh, to talk about every specific um, thing that happens but there's lots of little tiny oddities it's it's not fast so it's if you practice the chord forms and um, and track the flowing melody it'll sound beautiful and you won't find it too difficult but just make sure you've played lots of downland before 
Uh, it's one of the great pieces in the repertoire, so I, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> 